Okay, so because I like to talk, uh, I also prepared a short presentation about, uh, about me. So I'm going to skip over all the video stuff probably, uh, so you know why I'm doing this talk. Uh, so my, I, let's call it company, it's not really a company, it's uh, Alpha Moonbase, I'm based in Berlin. And what I do is called artistic engineering, and I think it's just like one new fancy buzzword, which uh, just means I do technical stuff. Because, uh, yeah, my name is Wieland Heker. Some of you might know me as a Jonas Schmidt on Facebook. I think some people have more of this name. Uh, and I'm uh, actually an event technician. So I work in a theater and conferences. I set up like projectors, control projectors, media server stuff, lighting, artnet, all this kind of stuff. So not really the design aspect, but really more the technical. Uh, and currently I work at the Deutsche Oper, at the Opera in Berlin. And yeah, I do freelance work as a light and video designer, sometimes a little bit stage design, stuff like this. And so like the biggest touch designer projects I'm going to brush over is uh, my media server Leica I created for theater work. Uh, Belka, which is um, yeah, touchscreen optimized live VJing uh, interface I like to use for VJ stuff. Uh, Posh, which is uh, for another theater production and dive in, which uh, I will talk about when I come to it. So Leica was born for the necess uh, necessity of a cheap media server. Um, and I think like the main part is it uses Artnet and has an interface, which is really easy and uh, fluently to use for everyone, especially for example, light technicians. Uh, so it can be integrated into the theater workflow really easy. Uh, so yeah, I built, for example, a touch designer inside of touch designer. It's like a touchception. Um, this one is like broke down to really the, the most essential. And yeah, basically this one was my interface design uh, system, which I created also on top, uh, which is generative. So this one analyzes uh, the network folder structure to create most of the parts about the, the interface. So for example, the affix layer, mix output, these are all components which are just in a folder structure. So no need to code anything by hand. Um, yeah, it looks like this when you select stuff, or like this. So uh, this is pre-widget, uh, and this one actually is like the first version. <laughs> it looks quite messy. This was my first attempt at interface design with Touch Designer. It was horrible. It worked, but it was horrible, and yeah, it looked a little bit like this. And also one of the nice things about this media server is you can use the real-time capabilities of Touch Designer, which I used at the foreign bodies. Uh, you can see like the, I used the Kinect camera combine and it looked nice, looked nice like this. Also more live video stuff uh, combined with video playback. Yeah, there you have also some generative stuff. Uh, this one was uh, another project same stage actually, three projectors, live camera, again all done in touch designer and controlled via Artnet, blah blah blah. Uh, edge blending, I think it's not so important. Okay, so this one is the VJ interface, it's completely based on drag and drop and again it's uh, really customizable in, in a lot of ways but uh, yeah the quality is shit, sorry for this. and. Uh, yeah, here's a short video. I'm going to skip over it just so you see what can be done. Is it blah, 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 blah. And no sound. I don't know if this sound is going to be recorded. Yeah, and it's completely done with a drag and drop, but we're not going to do any drag and drop today, sadly. But uh, I think Ivan might have to say something about this for the future. Uh, this one is another, it's, uh, yeah, I think way more interesting is this uh, Posh, uh, Porsche, it's a voting and also master uh, media playback system for people on stage, so, uh, and a voting system, so it was an interactive theater piece with uh, people uh, voting with uh, smartphones in the audience, done with uh, Node.js, 
and uh, some web sockets, stuff like this. Uh, thing, yeah, we skip this. Uh, so this one, again, you might see where this is coming from. It's uh, most of it like is again done uh, generatively. So no, nothing really placed by hand, but all just created. And also, for example, you can save presets for for your. Uh, <clears throat> For the uh, answer for the questions and the answers, stuff like this, you can save them in text and recall them and save them. And they're pretty Python heavy. And you have also this system where you can just play clips, like in the morning show or an evening show, or I don't know. Oh, yeah, this one, Dive In, was uh, quite interesting. Not so much about interfaces, but. Uh, interactivity and it sucked totally. It was really a complete disaster because the Kinect just didn't really work in a way it should work. So, and people are stupid, really, they're stupid. They can't read. If, if you have text on a screen, people are not gonna read it. So just skip the text. And in the end, it was just like the uh, smallest club in the city in a container, but it worked just somewhere in the morning. And I think that's it for the presentation about me. Uh, so we're going for the fantastic widgets and where to find them. And they can be found in the palette under UI. And there is already see it, basic widgets. And there you have some, some more stuff inside. Uh, so you have two, two styles of widgets by now. It's the core package and it's the basic widgets. And the core package is like all the basic stuff. So you have a checkbox button there, like this, radios, so you can uh, skip around. And in the core package, you have like all the, the masters where the basic widgets are derived from. And uh, what's interesting about the widget is you have compared, so this this like a button, maybe let's uh, take uh, this button for comparison. So here you have a button and you have another button. And you can see there's a really, really big difference in uh, how many parameters you actually have. So you have uh, values, label, button, widget, operators, and you can control basically everything from these parameters, from these custom parameters created. So for example, uh, you have the, the label. So um, this is a button. You can uh, change the, the color of the label. You can change the color of the, of the button, stuff like this. And you don't have to go inside at all. Because when we go inside, it gets quite complicated. We have uh, all of this stuff, and we have uh, some code, and even more stuff, and more stuff, and more stuff we don't need. We can do everything from the parameter level. And this is one of the big improvements, I think, uh, compared to, to the other stuff where you had to go inside sometimes or you have to build it your own with the uh, really old buttons in this way. So big improvement. And yeah, we have a lot of stuff like uh, floats for one and uh, floats for four even, which are mostly, yeah, one-to-one -one for the parameters you actually have, like different parameters. And you have even more, like uh, you have the knobs. But yeah, you have, uh, for example, three sliders, which do give you real-time feedback about the color you're choosing, which is really nice. So you're not uh, sitting there and looking at your visual when you want to mix the color, but you can just see it inside of your UI element. And what is there more? There's also this page, which looks really weird in a way, because 
Why do you have the values on the parameter page? I mean, normally what you would do is you, you just grab uh, the output, which is here, and then you drag and drop, export, reference the stuff. But this is just one way. And this is where the new feature of binding comes in. Because binding is a two-way parameter communication. So you can bind two parameters together. And when you change one of them, you also change the other one. So you don't have the situation anymore where you export this one, and then you have to go back to your UI every time you want to check something, how it works. But you can just still use the parameter you already have. So for example, if we take a, a ramp, which is here, and let's take a, a slider. Just a really simple, yeah, where's the slider? <laughs> Oh, yeah, maybe even like a 2D slider. So the old way would be to take a null and grab the channel and so just put it in here and put this one in here. So now you can uh, do some fancy shit just with the UI element. <clears throat> but the moment where we separate our UI from our components, which is what we are going to do, which is, will come in quite handy, um, you will have to go back and come back and go somewhere else to, um, and go back to your UI to change these values. Because the moment you, you put this one in, you break the reference, which is not what we want. So then we would have to go back and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this sucks. This really sucks. So what we are going to do is we are going to use binding. So this is why we have our parameters on this page. So what you can see now, if I change this parameter, I can actually change the UI with the parameter. And what we see, and again, when I change this one, we also change our values. And what I can do now, is I can grab this parameter and hover it over my operator. And I can drop it into my other parameter I want to control. So just drop it, and when we say bind, and now it gets purple. It's the fourth mode which got introduced newly. And as you can see now, when I change, have a change in my interface, woo, it changed this one. If I ever change in this parameter, it also changes this one. And here now comes the kicker. If I change this one, I'm also changing my UI element. Come again? Uh, repeat what? Yeah. Uh, boop, boop, boop. So I just grab value one. Uh, so we can do it with the uh, value two. I grabbed it for drag and drop. Hover it over the operator where I want to go. Hover it over, for now, period. And then you can just say, bind. And what bind is going to do is, it's just going to, to drop um, an expression for, yeah, the value one. So now we can work again in our network without really taking care of our UI and interface. Because we, yeah, it's bidirectional. But there's a big but. Uh, it's not as fast as exports or Python expressions. So there is, a, let's say, 
uh, offside. Like uh, it cooks a little bit longer. You have a performance hit. Yeah, I think this was the right word. Um, so for everything which is not UI, don't use it. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the slowest definitely is binding. Uh, then it's, huh? Oh, really? Okay. Good to know. <laughs> and the fastest is uh, definitely exports by now. But the Python, when you have like this. Uh, when you use the references, they got optimized in the last build, I think. So the hit you get from using Python expressions, uh, like the simple expressions and some math stuff and stuff like this is uh, way, way smaller than compared to to chops, uh, to chop exports by now. So as I said, it's uh, no problem by now to use uh, Python expressions. Um, Except you have like these really big scaling systems where uh, you could save like 0.1 milliseconds just using expressions. But for smaller stuff, go with Python expressions. Exports are basically dead. Um, yeah. So how do we change the range of our UI element? Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, because we're going, ah, let me just have a quick look at the, oh yeah, okay, this is really, really nice over, overarching, let me just see the clock, I think I'm way too fast, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely way too fast, so I think I will slow down a little bit. Um, let me just see, what time is it? Oh, it's uh, still the German time. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm way too fast, so I have to think of a way to, uh, not be so fast anymore. <laughs> okay, but let's get into custom parameters. I think they are quite interesting and one of the main topics. So, uh, who of you used uh, custom parameters? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So uh, custom parameters and in general basis a really, really great way to organize your network. And what you can do, I think we'll just create a new ramp. I like the ramp because you can really easily see what's going on. Uh, maybe we'll have some uh, tiling going on, which is here, and so we can now uh, bring this together into one single component, maybe even have uh, an LFO, and so in this case you can't even bind because there's by now, not a way to bind with chops, with chop channels, but there is going to be something in the future, I hear. It. But for now, um, we just use Python expression. So let's uh, take the face and say chop reference. So we have uh, this setup, and we want to bring these components, which uh, are moving and uh, just really confusing into one single component. And we can do it really easy because we just uh, select our three 
components we have here. And with a right click, we can say collapse selected. And we have a base. And so now all the three, yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so we're selecting our three components. And then with a right click into the network, not on the nodes, but on the network, we have a collapse selected, which is here. And when you press it, all of the components we selected get put into one base component. And if we double press or just go inside, we see, OK, works really nice. Um, it's still running strong. But what is if we now want to change the style of our RAM, for example? Or what is if we want to change the way the tiling works? We would now, for now, we'll have to go inside and change it go back. And this is, especially with bigger networks, it gets really frustrating to do it because you will have to look and be like, oh, okay, where's my ramp? And okay, here's my ramp and find this parameter and all the other parameters you actually just don't give a shit about. So it would be nice if we have a way to bring and just select the parameters we actually want and have them in one place on the top level. And this is what custom parameters are for. And we can use the custom parameters uh, or create custom parameters in uh, two ways, the hard way and the easy way. And we're, of course, starting with the hard way. And this can be done by right-click on the component. And then we say customize component. And you will have this uh, component editor window. I will maybe make it a little bit bigger for you. And also, uh, again, when we press right click on our component and choose parameters, we get a window of our parameters floating. So we can uh, have a better overview without the network for now. And what we can do now is we can add a page. So let's have this page and let's just call it a control. And you can now see on the right side that we have a page, but it's still empty. So we want to add a parameter. And we already know, okay, we want to change the period of our uh, RAM top. So we can, we, we know the period, yeah, okay, the period is, uh, is a float, I think. So because it has values between one and zero, and uh, we have one of it. So this is what you can change here, yes. Um, you can go to page name here, uh, put in control, so let's do it again, let's add also a second page, which we call output, because maybe we also want to control the resolution of our uh, RAM, and so for later, we are going to put in output, and then we say add page. OK. And we go back to, so here we can change our sites, which we want to edit. Uh, we're going back to control. And 
So we know we want to change the period. We know the period is uh, one digit, uh, it's yeah, one value parameter, and it's a float. Okay, so we put in the name period, and then we uh, say add parameter or add par. And now we see we have created our own parameter. And we can drag it around. Which is uh, very nice. Um, but what we see is we only can move our period between 1 and 0. But what if we want to, for example, go to a period of uh, 2? When you select the parameter, you can see the range minimum and the range maximum. And we're just going to set, instead of from 1 to 0, uh, from 0 to 1, we're going to set it to 0 to 2. And we hit Enter. And now you can see I can drag my slider all the way to the right. And we have a value of 2. So let's go back to our network. And uh, let's close this one for now. Whoops. And we see we, we do something. We change the period. But nothing's happening. Because we still have to. Yes. OK. <clears throat> Um, because we still we have to tell the component what it should do with the period. So we, uh, for now, come back inside of our base, and here we have the period. And we have two ways of, uh, or actually three ways, but we're just looking at two ways of uh, bringing the period parameter. Hello. <laughs> uh, of bringing the period parameter into our ramp. The first one is uh, probably the most uh, performance best one. It's uh, using the parameter chop, which is here. <clears throat> and you can already see we have our period value we put into our base. So maybe let's uh, split our network so we have a better overview. So now if I change this parameter, we just created our custom parameter. You can see that the chop also is changing. And then we just do an export into our period and that just say export chop. So now if we change this one, you can see that we also control the period of our RAM top. So Let's create uh, a new parameter for our position. Yes. The exporting. OK. Um, so with a right click onto our parameter, and we can say remove export. So now it no longer controls the value of our top. So let's do it again. We create a oops, parameter chop, which is here.
drop it into our network. Then we activate the viewer, grab our channel, so you have this uh, arrow pointing to the right, hover it over the ramp, go to period, and drop it and say export chop. This is currently the fastest way to get values from A to B. It's, um, but it doesn't matter in the smaller setups. So there's a second way we can do it. And the second way is by uh, using a Python reference, which also works really nice. So we're going to create a new set of parameters for the position x and y of the ramp. So again, we go right click on our base, customize component, and we say position. And again, we know it's a float, probably. So we have floats, but it's two values now. It's no longer just uh, one value, but it's two. So what we can do is, we can change the size of our parameter to actually two. And we named it position, and then we say again, add parameter. So now you can see we have uh, this one and this one. But again, if we type in anything, nothing happens. So let's close our uh, component editor. And what we can now do is we can either way, uh, for example, type in by hand a Python expression. So what we want is we want to have the parent of the component we are currently working with, which in this case is base1. And we want to access a parameter with the name of position. And we want to have the first parameter of the position we just created. So what we can type in is parent. Uh, so this is a function call to just get the, the next one. Uh, we put in a dot. Then, because we want to access a parameter, we put in a par. And then we take the name of the parameter we want to access. So it's position. Let's try. And if we hit enter, we get an error. It's uh, OK. Because uh, position actually just is the label. There's a difference for the parameters between label and name. The label can be anything. It uh, can have uh, spaces. It can have uh, all the different Sonderzeichen. Sorry, I don't, I don't know the word, like uh, asterisk and stuff like this. Um, it can start with a small letter, stuff like this. And the name is what we will use in the programming. And it has pretty strict rules for custom parameters. Uh, which is no spaces. It has to start uh, with a big letter. It will automatically do this if you put in like a non-legal name. And how we can find out the name of our parameter? Uh, yeah, the name. We just press this uh, little plus, and then we have the two parameters. And we see it's called position one and position two. So we put in position one, and we can now see that we have the same value as position one and position two. What we could also do is we can grab our parameter, our custom parameter, and just drop it into the other parameter. So again, I will grab my position two and drop it in here and just say uh, reference. And you can see it's not typing it in by hand, because if you would have to type in everything by hand, it, would, it gets tiring. 
really easily. And this is why there's actually a way faster way of creating custom parameters and uh, reference ending already. Uh, and for this, we will have to go into our component editor again, which is here, customize component. And so we want to control our, our output. So we go into our second page, which is still empty by now, so we see it here. And what we can do now, uh, we go to the common page and we have the uh, output resolution. So we just say, uh, set it to custom resolution. And we want these two parameters on our top level, on our base one. So what we can do is we just put a, select the resolution, the uh, parameter here, and we just drop it in here and say uh, set reference expression on source. And it automatically creates the reference and it also automatically creates the new parameters and sets the new parameter. Come again? Yes. So now we can control the resolution from our base one. So if we type in 1280, ta-da. <laughs> So, but let's say we now want to, again, inside of our base one, it might get bigger again, and we have some new stuff going on, stuff like this, uh, where you put like effects inside of effects. And we later realize, okay, it would be really nice to, to maybe put just the ramp or adjust the tile, because this is our FX, uh, probably it's bigger, but for now we would just use this one. Uh, oh no, no, let's, let's take the ramp for organizing. So when we select it, right click and say collapse selected, we get an error. And let's see what the error is. And it says, uh, yeah, there's no position one, there's no position two, we don't have resolution, all the stuff is not existing on our base one. What we could do is we could create the parameters again and stuff like this, but again, this is way too much work. So it would be nice if we have a way to always reference this base one. And it doesn't matter, yeah? Do you have a question? No, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> and it would be nice if we have a way of always, and it doesn't matter where inside of our base one we are, to always reference the base one, the master. Uh, let's, let's just call this one, give it a name. Let's just call it, uh, oops, this was not intended. Oh shit, uh. Okay. Uh, so let's call this one master. So it would be nice if we can always reference our master from anywhere inside of the master. And we can do it by selecting it and go to the comment page. And there we have a parent shortcut. And with the parent shortcut, we can give it a, a name. And with this name, from anywhere inside of our component, we can access our component, our master component on the master level. So let's just call it master. 
Um, we're not really sure about the differences in the community, how to actually uh, write the parent shortcut. I like to just use capital letters, but uh, it's up to you, let's say. And yeah, we just called master. And now we can, with the name master, from anywhere inside of the master, access the master and its parameters. So let's go inside of our base we just created and see where all the errors are. Okay, here we have an error, here we have an error. So what we do is, instead of calling the uh, parent uh, with the brackets, we are just calling parent and we are putting in parent.master dot parse, so the parent.master is our master component. So if we hit enter, you see the error is gone. So let's replace all the parent with parent.master. And the master is the parent shortcut we put on our component. So you can call it master, you can call it slave, you can have primary generator fx, it doesn't matter. Yes. Yes, yes. It is level independent. Uh, just looks, okay, where's the next master? You can also have like master inside of master inside of master. In this case, if they all have the same parent shortcut. Yes, this, yeah, it will always take the first the first one. So if you have a master inside of a master, it will always take the first master, so the first one, yeah. Which can be really useful, but can also be fucking horrible if you just forgot to, to really name, uh, have the wrong naming convention. I had this problem preparing this workshop that uh, I just got an error and I was like, why is the error? And it was one parent shortcut I put somewhere <laughs> inside. So, um, yeah. So, also, here we are uh, referencing uh, the LFO operator, which is, in fact, inside of our master. So again, yes. Just let me have a look. Yes. No, you have to put the uh, master parent shortcut on the top level where the uh, custom parameters are. This is why I renamed them from, because two base ones are maybe a little bit uh, too much. <clears throat> but yeah, we can access the uh, parent master, also use it to access operators inside of our master. So we can write in parent, master, and then inside of our master component, we want to have the uh, LFO1 and channel1, and if we'd enter, now oh, it's doing the funny thing again. And let's do it also for this one. Okay, so, now it, everything is working again, and now just, just for the shit of it, let's uh, put this ramp again inside of, of another component. So right click, collapse selected, but it's still running. It doesn't matter where inside of our master component it is. We, uh, yeah, it just works everywhere. Boop, 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 boop. So also if we cut it out and delete this one and bring it back. 
it will work. Yes, uh, with the phase we are referencing in, uh, of the operator LF01, uh, the channel one. So what we can do now, ah, okay, the export actually broke. So uh, export, it says export not found because we copied around and uh, I cut it out and stuff like this. So also one of the really big good things about the um, parent shortcut is it breaks basically never. So, yeah, maybe let's uh, also do it with the period, split left, right. Go to control. And create a new parameter. So, customize component, control, and uh, let's... Take the, ah, uh, no, 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 okay, we don't have to go in here. Uh, take the period, drop it in, reference, and now we can just play around. So, this is one of the effects or generators we have. And uh, it might be good if we have a way to, to put a label on them, in a way, so we can find this one later, for later, way more easy. And you can do it by adding a tag. You can add tags to component to later find them, and uh, there are some Python functions or operators you can use to uh, organize your bases, which is what we are going to do. And you can find the tag is uh, here in the right corner of the component. Uh, we say show tag, and let's call this one generator. And we say add tag. And now this component is for us, and definitely for later. A generator. Okay, we really, really think is everything okay for you? Do we have to repeat something? Uh, I'm just asking because we got time. Like my timetable was way too generous. Yes, I, I'm coming over to you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, I will show the, the problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe scroll up one level. Uh, yeah, because you only have uh, one position. So maybe go into the uh, editor, customize component. Uh, delete the position, yeah, and drop it in again. So go inside of your master. Just just double click the master, and 
Ooh, no, maybe move the component editor to the left. No, this one, the component editor, no, to the left. So, and now just grab the position and drag it in to the parameter. Yeah, exactly. Ah, oh, no, 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 you. Ah, okay, no, no, you, you bind it. So maybe delete this one again also. <laughs> Uh, just grab position, like not position one or two, but just position. And then you say set reference expression on source. Okay, now you have it. Now you have it back. <coughs> okay, so there was one question, I think it was you, why it broke. And the answer is... Uh, we have this base, and you have the base with the parent shortcut master, and now it broke. Because the problem is, uh, when you use the parent shortcut, uh, parent.master, you just take the next one. And because you have two master components, he's currently looking at the base, this base one, which is the wrong one. So, uh, just if you delete this one, the reference gets restored again. Also, I think you had the question about uh, referencing the chop. Yeah, so there are two ways. There's this uh, internal thing going on, which is uh, I actually never used because <laughs> Uh, for this kind of stuff, I really like to use extensions. I don't know if there's a difference in a way when you create a property and use the internal operator. It's a choice. <laughs> okay, so maybe let's just see. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, if you want to reference the LFO channel from anywhere inside of the component, uh, there's a new feature. Sorry? So, continue <laughs> or no? It's it's it, if you have a question, it's okay, but. Yes, no. Oh, okay. Oh, you can unbase it. It uh, sounds interesting. Um, so, if you want to reference uh, any operator inside of uh, anywhere inside, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, one is the internal operator shortcut, which is uh, pretty handy. So, Let's uh, split left, right, and have a look at our master. And here again on the comment page, you have this internal OP shortcut. And so we can just take our LFO and drop it into the internal OP one. And we give it the name of LFO. Maybe just write a big. And now when we are uh, inside, so we go into our base one, which is the ramp. Instead of a parent.master.op.lfo, which is quite long, uh, we can just write IOP for internal operator, a dot, and then we just reference the name we just created. So in this case, LFO. But this is just referencing the operator, this one. And you see it breaks because it's like, ah, I, I need a value. I don't need a, a chop object. I need a channel and I need a value. So 
we just write channel one, and now it works again. And now we can just move it around as we like, um, and it won't break. And the second possibility is going into extensions. Who used extensions? Okay, nice. So uh, we will take it slow with the extensions. Um, maybe, fuck this. So extensions, or are there more questions for the custom parameters? Or is everyone now sufficient in creating their own custom parameters as they like and bringing everything together? Good, 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 good. Nice. So what are extensions? Extensions are the tool of the gods, I like to say. <laughs> Um, they're very powerful, they're a little bit complicated, and they're really, really, really Python heavy. So this is the point where we definitely need uh, the text editor. And uh, yeah, extensions, how do we do extensions? With extensions, you can create new methods, functions, for your custom operator, you just create it. So, uh, for example, you can create new new functions like, uh, I don't know, sending an email. It uh, can be done, and you just have like this one email uh, component, and then you just write in op email send, and then it's just sending the email. Uh, so you can put a lot of functionality. You sometimes have to do with like 20 operators into really easy, readable Python script. And how do we create them? So for now, maybe let's create a second LFO, just so, so we have it. Oops. It's here. Um, OK, how do we create an extension? We right click again. And we, again, go to Customize Component. And as you can see down here, we have the extension code. And here is uh, something going on. So what we can do now is we create our extension by uh, typing in a name. Um, there's, again, a little convention of uh, writing ext before the extension, so it's uh, clear because it's going to create a dat inside of our component. And so we can always, on the first view, see the name, So uh, and that it's um, an extension. So we will call it ext master comp. And then we say add. And when we take a look inside of our master comp here, doop, doop, doop. yeah, somewhere it's here, so maybe let's move all our stuff around. And here it is, and it looks really menacing on the first side, but we're going to tidy it up for a little moment, so we just take the really important stuff. So uh, what we can do is we can edit it inside, which is horrible, because you have no syntax highlight and stuff like this. So this is where I hope you have a Sublime or a Notepad++. And we can just right click, and we just say Edit Contents. And this will start your text editor of of love, I don't know. 
which one you use. There is currently uh, a problem. I don't know if they fixed it in the last release with uh, at least uh, Sublime and Visual Studio Code, where sometimes if you don't save, uh, it will not get transported into Touch Designer. I don't know. Uh, is this uh, still a problem with the Sublime and the not saving and uh, importing correctly? So when you save in uh, Sublime and it's not... Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ah, in the latest version. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you have the latest version, there shouldn't be a problem, but it could be that there is a, a problem with updating the uh, text. But I hope it all works for now. So this is an extension, or this is the class definition of an extension. And it's a lot of Python. And maybe we would just have a look at it and delete all the stuff we might not need for now, but maybe uh, we will have it later. So one is, uh, yeah, comments. Stuff like this. No one needs it. Actually, yes, a lot of us need it. But uh, for us now to, to really understand what is the uh, main part of the extension, we can delete this one. Um, the next one is uh, some importing stuff. Um, we'll actually keep the uh, TDF for now. So delete the uh, from TD store, store tools, import, store manager stuff. Um, we can just delete this one also. Then uh, we have, again, some comments. Not really necessary for now, so uh, let's also delete the comments. And yeah, so we have our init function, which is here. And uh, yeah, there's where a lot of the stuff gets defined, where we uh, set up, for example, our properties. And properties are going to be really interesting for us now. And so, the first property is a self-owner comp. And this one will get used in functions and methods we define ourselves. But for now, um, yeah, we will just keep it. And this one, the self.owner comp, is uh, the component we are extending. I hope this makes sense. It will make sense in a moment. So we leave it. The second is properties. And properties are a really nice way of uh, giving your components an easier way to read, in a way. So when you want, uh, we maybe can just try it. <clears throat> so we have this TDF create property. Uh, we put in the cell, which is not so important for us now. We have uh, the name of the property. This one is called uh, my property. And we would just check it so we can see what's happening. And it has a starting value of zero. And really important for this case might be if it's dependable. And dependable means that you can um, access the property from somewhere, like in a Python expression, like for a parameter. And that when we change the value of the property, um, it also changes the parameter. If this makes sense. Uh, we, we can have a look at it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> so um, when it's dependable and we reference our property inside of, um, of a parameter, for example, uh, I just have to find a way to say it really nicely. <laughs> um, and we change the value of our property, 
it will also change the value of our parameter. I will just demonstrate it uh, so we, we uh, can understand it better. And uh, the fourth one is read only. So with read only set to true, you can't change uh, the value of the property, which is pretty useless in most of the ways, but we can keep it, uh, so we set it to false. Uh, then we have, we're just going coming back to the property in a moment. Just let us finish. Then we have uh, attributes. And attributes are like properties in a way, but they cannot be dependable. So we can use them inside of our code. It's uh, quite easy. And also we have a kind of a problem that at uh, the moment we reinitialize uh, our uh, extension or we restart touch designer or we cover export it and import it to a new project, all of these values will be set back to the base value, the standard value. So with the stored items, you can also create properties which will be saved over for restarts and uh, putting stuff somewhere else, which is, um, yeah, well, we would just uh, actually delete this one because for now we don't need it. And then we have uh, two functions, two function definitions. It's uh, my function and promoted function. And the difference between uh, promoted and non-promoted functions is that with, uh, when it's written in a small starting letter, you cannot access the function from outside. So you can just call it internally. And the promoted functions can be called from outside of the class, which will make sense later. Just keep it in mind. Okay, so we say uh, control S, and now we see, okay, we have some stuff changing. And now if we take our new LFO, And for the frequency, we want to now um, use the my property, which is quite easy. So we can write parent, master, and then we just say my property. Uh, so this is not the best example, actually. So maybe let's let's use a, a circle so I can demonstrate the difference. So let's say, yeah, rotate gets parent, master, my property. And let's say the fill alpha gets the B, which we defined here. So I can say again, parent, master, and B. So and what we can do now is we can change the properties we just created, uh, properties and attributes, with code. And so for this, let's uh, for now create a, a text that. And write in uh, parent, master, my property, and we say equals, I don't know, like uh, 130. So, and if we have a look now here, 
at the rotate. And we can now say with a right click onto this one, and we can say run script. So this is a really nice way to, to check if scripts work, if uh, your functions work, is to just put them in a text and just say run script, or you can select it and uh, press Control R. Uh, or you can call it uh, in the text bar, but this one is quite the easiest and easiest to understand. So we say run script. And you see, okay, the, uh, my property changed to 130, and our circle that automatically updated to 130. Now, let's do the same with a B, which is set to, to 1. And now we call this one by setting to B. And let's set this one to 0. OK, again, right click. And we say run script. And nothing happens. Why? What, what, what happened? Why didn't anything happen? Because our attribute B is not dependable. It is not forcing an update of the value inside of our top. So what we have to do for this, we have to actually say our, or call our operator, top operator and force it to cook. Because every time the operator cooks, it's evaluating uh, the parameters new. So we can say right click, and we just say force cook. And now it evaluated our attribute, ask again, hey, what's going on? Anything new? Oh, you have a new value. OK, all right, I take it. Ooh, lasers. Many, many lasers. Okay, so what can we do with it? We can delete this one, delete this one, we don't need it. But we can say now that we don't call this one my property, but we call it LFO. And the starting value is not. Uh, yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. This one doesn't matter because, uh, okay, there was a, one of the errors is when you call the extension, you don't call the extension class, but you just call the operator we extended. And this is what it's making so powerful. So you don't have to write uh, parent.master.external class, blah, blah. You just have to call the operator and the parent master, the master parent. And then you just ask for the property. So it just looks like it belongs there because, yeah. So do you have it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, parent, master. Yeah, definitely. You don't call this one, but you call uh, my property. Your property is in the class definition. And this is where you call it create property, my property. Okay, so we fixed this one. Any questions for now? Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> uh, so we got time. So if you have questions, please ask. Okay, come again. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes. No, they are stored inside of the component. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, we don't need this one for now. It's uh, because they have some icky stuff you have to work around sometimes. So there's another way I like way more, and you have more control. But we have a look. So uh, how can we make use of this whole property dependable stuff? Uh, so let's call this one uh, LFO, our new property. And instead of a value of zero, we can use, uh, for example, an operator. So we just say op LFO1. And this actually might not be the best idea to just write it this way, because uh, if you move the extension file that to somewhere else, it might break. So the safe way is to actually just say uh, self, oops, self owner comp op. Oops, it's a PP, no, it's an OP. And this way, we are always referencing this operator at this level. And so we can move around the extension, maybe, or move it outside, or in an external file, or anything. It's, uh, it's just a safe way. So. Yes. Yeah, and it will always be owner comp. It doesn't matter uh, in which extension you are, but because you can have several components all referencing the same extension that. So yeah, not necessary for now, but better teaching it right in the beginning. So uh, this is like the safe way to go. So what we can do now, uh, maybe, yeah, let this one play. Let me change it to to a ramp, maybe. So uh, when we now go inside to our ramp, we don't we can now use the IOP, but we can also write now parent master uh, and access. Oh. Oh, yeah. And uh, we want to have the first channel. So, how is this handy? Um, it's pretty handy because now we can use a script. So, let's create a new text top. And we can now say with a simple script, we can change our operator to another one and use it. So we can say parent master LFO equals OP LFO2. No, you don't have to do it because now we are calling it from outside. So with this simple line, we no longer have to go inside of our base, find our ramp, and, and change the LFO by hand. But we just call this line, run the script. So yeah, and I think this one is uh, really nice. <laughs> Got it? Okay, so I think this is a good point to maybe have a short coffee and cigarette break. Maybe. Yes, exactly. No, it will not be saved. 
It could be safe, but it won't be. <laughs> um, okay. So maybe, yeah, we will see on uh, 15 minutes. You can have a look again, and in 15 minutes, formulate your question. And then we can maybe go over the question, and we have a deeper look about how to create functions and how to use the functions. OK, everyone. Um, so let's continue, maybe. So the timetable got a little bit thrown over by my fast talking. And you got understanding. So we can continue. Uh, one really nice aspect of uh, this whole putting everything into bases is also that you can save them. So you have like your really nice effect with your custom parameters and you want to save them uh, for later use. So you can just put them in the palette, for example, which is, uh, let's open the palette. And here you have my components. And what you can do is you can take the base and just drop it in here. No, you can't. Ah, okay, I need to make, okay. We have to add a folder called my effects. And then you can just drop it in. And now from anywhere, if you start a new project, you, can, uh, you will have this My Effects folder in your palette. And you can just drag and drop it. So let's have a look. So yeah, this is uh, one way of doing it to save your work for later. And what you can also do is, we will delete this one. And it's because he asked me if uh, he can have the network. And I could save now the project, for example. But uh, this is boring. What we are going to do is, uh, we are going to externalize our component. And we do it by uh, right-clicking on our component we just created, our base. And we say, save component talks. And then. We can go to this USB, uh, we call it Workshop Interfaces Master. And we're saving it. And now you have this, uh, if we look here, we have our Workshop Interface Master Talks. And again, we can just drop it in. So this is another way of transporting smaller components you created to uh, other projects, share with others. And because we have this uh, really nice custom parameter stuff going on, we don't need to, uh, for, the, for the person you're giving this effect to, for example, uh, we don't need the person to, um, to dive in. He can just use what is there. He doesn't need to, to understand anything. He just understands, oh, OK, so here are my parameters I can play around with. And uh, great. So I'm just going to uh, get this one out. Now I can give it back to him. Yep, no problem. And now he has the master I just saved. This is just for, for uh, using later. So let's have a look. Clean up your network now. So um, I think somewhere, so maybe let's have a little bit of free flow and create a really messy network we want to use. So um, something like, uh, I think this one, this master here is a good start. Uh, maybe no, this isn't. But I think I had someone. OK, who has a messy network? 
to share. Anyone? No messy networks? Okay, so let's create a messy network and uh, have like, okay, we take an uh, LFO, say ramp, we have uh, another ramp, we say, um, then we have a tile, uh, we feed this one into a switch, and also here we have a maybe a render and a sphere with some noise oops some noise going on and we feed this one into a geometry and have a camera uh, maybe a light. I should have prepared this one, and I think I have it somewhere, but... Oh, what are also some nice generators? Oh, yeah, some noise. Definitely, some noise. So, let's put this one over here. So, we have this noise here. And we have the take a 4D noise, then we have like a pattern, or, or maybe another LFO. Now we're going to, to do some translation. Just putting this here and uh, feeding this also in here, just referencing this one. And uh, so maybe have a, a feedback, which is also often very nice. Uh, I think it should work like this. Yeah. Okay, it works. So, oh, and maybe, maybe because our we are really funky today, we also have a have an edge going on here. So maybe some uh, RGB stuff so we can change the color. Okay, so so yeah. Oh, and yeah, let's let's feed this one. Let's have a window like this and. Uh, yeah, so I've seen a lot of networks like this. <laughs> who has seen a network like this? <laughs> who did a network like this and who actually still works like this? I mean, it's okay. <laughs> um, so let's organize our network. And we actually, in the end, want to create a UI. So maybe. Let's call this one our engine, because this is the stuff which uh, creates our output. What well, we want to see in the end, what is uh, happening for us. So we select all of it, and uh, yeah, let's collapse this one and call it our engine. So we can't see anything, but uh, I do you want to have the network, maybe. So I think it's a good idea if we all have this network. So the question is, do you want to build it your own, or do you want to, 
that have a round with the stick. Yeah. Okay, so everyone has the engine network, the messy one. Okay, so let's start by uh, giving our engine a parent shortcut. Uh, well, let's call it let's call it just engine, which is good to know. And we can already here start to think about okay, what are uh, parameters we might need on engine level? Um, so the resolution, for example, because we have a uh, several. Uh, Wrong one. So, uh, because we have several generators which are all now running at different resolutions, and if we, for example, want to do it in 4K, uh, we would have to go inside, which is definitely not necessary because we can just, uh, for now, take the ramp, take the resolution, drop it in, set reference. And so we can just copy the parent engine power resolution one. And we're going to do the same for our render top. And we're going to do the same for our noise top. So all of all of these three are uh, the same resolution, and we can control it from one place. And this is the engine level. So let's think, or maybe we need a master speed because we have uh, two different uh, we have two different LFOs, and we want them to have the same speed. So Let's uh, take our LFO, take the frequency, put it in, set reference, and then we can just copy this one, go to this LFO, put in the frequency. So now we have one place where we can change the base frequency of our two LFOs. Okay, so we have three generators. So let's let's have them. Let's organize them. So we select these three. Right click and collapse selected. We have our sphere. Right click, collapse selected. And we have these three. Right click and collapse selected and we give them names like ramp noise sphere and this one is just noise so for us to find that these are our generators, we're going to tag them so we can find them. So we select all of them, go to the tag, and we call them generator, and we add the tag. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. And, okay, let's look here. We have our edge and our level. So, these two belong together. So, we say right click and collapse select it. And let's call this one edge. And we have our feedback loop. Let's select it, collapse, 
and call this one feedback. Very nice. And because of the fun of it, let's take the switch. If it's alone, maybe we can change it up a little bit later. And uh, collapse this one also. And let's just call it switch. Much cleaner. Yes. Y yes, it is uh, necessary for our uh, little generative approach to have like everything which we want to input into our UI generator is a base. Okay, so we have our edge and our feedback and they are FX. So we tag them with an FX tag. And we have our switch, which is uh, yeah, like a controller. So we call it control. Oops, or CTRL. Nice. This looks really clean. And we can, when you press the uh, C button, you even have uh, the possibility to color them differently according to, to how you like it. So this way we can see, okay, we have a ramp, we have our three generators, we have one control base, and we have our two effect bases. Nice and clean. So let's go into finding some uh, parameters. So what we can do now is uh, we select our generators and we just say parent shortcut and call them generator. Call this one parent fx and parent cdrl. It's not really necessary, but this makes referencing the parameters we're going to add a little bit easier. So let's go into our ramp. So what could we want to control in this whole ramp and tire setup? Uh, it's, this one now really is uh, up to you. It's a free flow, so you can just search for the parameters you want to control. So, for example, I want to control the period. I want to control the type. I want to you know, maybe extend left, extend right, or maybe even have the... Uh, change this one up a little bit and... Use the interpolate. And uh, so for the tiling, we maybe want to have uh, the repeat. Repeat this one. Uh, it should reflect. Okay, so good to go. Let's go to the noise sphere. Maybe we want to have a period of our noise, harmonics, roughness, exponent, uh, amplitude. Look out for a sphere when you have the rows and the columns. Oh, yeah, and maybe add, uh, let's add a, a texture to our geometry, sorry for this. And here we maybe want to have the diffuse color. And maybe if it's a wireframe, why not? Wireframe is always nice. Yeah.
But yeah, it's you don't need really to follow and take the same uh, parameters I did. You can just look up what you like. So um, yeah, let's go to our noise. And uh, ah yeah, sorry, I forgot one little trick. So let's go back to the ramp actually for now and uh, customize component. And what I like to do, because now if we change up the speed, the master speed, it will always be um, the same master speed for, and they will always run in the same. So let us have some control over our ramp LFO, but have them in sync anyway. And this is like, because we are just going to use uh, twos, like, uh, two times the LFO, one time the LFO speed, four times, so this time they will always be back in sync, just like in music, you have like a, your fourth. And so let's create an integer, and let's call it an X speed exponent, and let's say from minus two to two. Uh, so let's copy this name. So when we go to the LFO, oops, to the frequency, we can now also do mathematical operations inside of our operator and combine different parameters, custom parameters we created. So we want this one to be two times uh, this one is the uh, exponent, the two asterisk, and put in the uh, parent generator. Oh, no. Ah, yeah, because we have to use the par. Sorry, my bad. So now if we change the speed exponent, we get the like one time, two times, four times, quarter, half of it. So they will always be in sync with another. And let's do the same for, uh, for our noise. Okay, so we go into our noise, customize component, and uh, we're looking here. Okay, so maybe let's have the type. Let's have the period harmonics. Uh, pfft, harmonic gain is also interesting. Exponent. Um, and the amplitude. Um, maybe if it's uh, monochromatic. And also the uh, speed exponent as an in, uh, integer from minus two to two. And let's just copy this one in. Okay, so now already we can uh, play around with on just one level. We don't have to go inside anymore. We can just have a look at all these parameters we made and we can now make this fast, slow, say vertical, have it there circular, have it no reflection, have it really fast. And we're going to do the same with the edge. This is just exercising finding the right parameters. So, for example, the uh, strength, the edge color is also quite interesting. Uh, sample step. And uh, yeah, maybe what to select. And also because we want to be able to turn it on and off, and maybe not just, yes. <laughs> Very nice.
um, we create a, another switch. I ah, know, not a switch, but a blend top. No, a, what is it called? Oh, it's a cross. Cross top. Uh, we're going to put this one in here also. So now we can turn it on and off the effect. And yay, let's do the same for the feedback. This gets tiring. <laughs> so here it's actually just the opacity we, we want to, to do. Uh, one trick, you can also right click over here and say customize component. So let's just put this one in here. Should work. So now you can see if we look here, you can make it really strong. Or maybe have the Okay. And the same for the switch. Should work for now. Oops, where's the engine switch? Uh, let's just have the index and say, okay, blend between inputs. So now we can, if we look here, have a smooth fade. And we can, so, yeah, this is our interface in the workshop, so. <laughs> No, yes. Yes. Um, they are a little bit uh, more difficult, the whole ramp, because uh, if we go into the ramp and have a look here, you see this little button. And if you open it, you see this is where the definition of uh, the whole ramp takes place. So it's not actually these values, which are just going to, to change our debt, and the debt is going to be used to... Uh... Yes, yes, you can. So this, for example, would be something you could write into, a, into an expression or use and evaluate that which is really nice, but I think we uh, will not dive deeper into this. Maybe later, when we have the time, but... Yes. So, we're taking our frequency, and we're uh, multiplying it by two, uh, we're then we use this one, which is an exponent. So you're saying, uh, I don't know how to describe the exponent, maybe. Uh, so you have them always in sync anyway. So uh, because with the, uh, if you take two by uh, minus one, for example, you will get half of it. If you uh, exponented by one, you would, oh no, no, by zero, you will get half of it. Uh, I'm not so sure, <laughs> but uh, it's just a, a trick. I think this one is too tight by now. Okay, so let's have a look at the clock. Yes, yes, this would make it way easier, so we can just copy and paste a lot of the uh, of the things going on. Yes, so for example, then you could uh, some stuff copy and paste just around. All right, we got it for now. Uh, so. 
let's delete this one. We don't want to have this one inside of our engine because it's not part of the engine. The engine is just generating everything and stuff like this. So uh, let's delete our window even if we never used it. And also let's delete the null and replace it with an output, with an out. So now if we scroll up, we can see it here. And uh, so actually for now, we will no longer have to go inside of our engine if we do everything right, which would be nice. So we're still in project one. We won't, don't want to have it as project one. So uh, maybe let's uh, select this ones and collapse them again and call this one my VJ interface. Or you can give it a really cool name like a uh, Pixel Destroyer 68 or something like this. <laughs> and uh, we will call this one, uh, also give this a parent shortcut. Uh, we just call it uh, myVJ. And because in the end we don't want to go inside of uh, our VJ interface, maybe let's also get the resolution up here. So again, Customize component and select the resolution, drop it in. Perfect. So now we can change the resolution on our main level. It's like a way to, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Because in this case, because we don't want to go, basically, not really want to go inside in the end, we don't need it to be so uh, bound. And also, let's replace this now by our output. Oh, my hand is starting to hurt. It's uh, crazy. Okay, so we can change it to this. But, and now we're starting to get into interface uh, situations. <laughs> um, we want this component to represent our interface we're going to create now. And we can't do it as a base. And there's uh, two kinds, like, yeah, there are more kinds, but uh, we have two components in a way, no, it's, it's wrong, but um, we want to have a container. And the big difference between a base and a container is that the container is interactive. So you can interact with a container and place, for example, buttons inside. You can place, uh, you can recall when it's pressed, if it's pressed by right click, left click, stuff like this. So what we can do is we can right click on uh, our new VJ interface. Uh, we can say change comp type. And we want it to be a container. I think basically we could also convert it to a widget, but uh, not do it. Let's have a container. And it's black. <laughs> so what we see now is uh, black blob, a black rectangle, in the wrong size, because we want our interface to, to match our, uh, our screen. So let's uh, give it a nice 16 by 9 resolution or size. And uh, yeah, let's dive inside. So we have our engine, we have our output. So let's create another container. And we call this one, give it the name of a UI. And we give it the parent shortcut, master UI. 
And there are now several ways how, because now it's smaller than our master uh, interface. So there are several ways. We could type it in by, uh, maybe let's, uh, we can change the appearance for us now so we can uh, better organize everything by uh, changing the background color. It's in the uh, look tab of our container. I think I just have to sit down now. Oh, yep. So uh, when we look up, we see now our container we just created inside uh, visible. But it's the wrong size. So we can change it to type it in by hand. So now maybe, so with right click on a container and view, you can open it. So maybe let's have this one sitting here. But the problem is now if we change the size of our uh, master UI, uh, of our like VJ UI uh, size, it will no longer match because we just hard coded it. And hard coding is not the generative way. So, what we could do is we could ask parent my VJ and we can ask for the width. Oh, uh, no, we can't. Okay, we can ask for the width parameter, which is one way. But uh, there's a way simpler way, and this is using uh, anchors and vertical and horizontal mode on the layout page. And we're going to use this one primarily. I designed a lot of my interfaces with, uh, with expressions, but this one is also a really, really intuitive way. So we changed the horizontal mode to fill. And you see, OK, this one got grayed out. And this one also. And the vertical mode also to fill. And this way we can change the size of our master UI, master my VJ. And this one will always have the same size. So now we can go inside of our UI. And let's have a little thinking about how we want to design our, our UI or interface. Um, so what I like to do and what we're going to do is we will have uh, on the left side a preview of our uh, currently selected component. On the right side, we're going to see the output what will be displayed on the projector. On the bottom left side, we will have uh, our controls. And on the right side, we will have a preset recourse system. Yay, presets. Everyone wants that. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can now start to, to design uh, this situation. So we create a new container. And so we can see what's actually going on. We give it a nice blue color. And we have to create the background alpha and set it to 1. And now you can see we got it here. And let's call this one uh, preview. And then we can go back to the layout. And this is going to be our. Um, so we're going to put the preview and the selected. Actually, we. Yes, we have to. Um, we're going to put the preview uh, on top. And it's going to span the whole uh, interface we just created. So we go to horizontal mode and just say fill. And now it fits everywhere. And now vertical mode. We want uh, it not to fill, but to actually be relative to the whole situation. So we can go to anchors. 
And you can now see you have the bottom anchor and you have the top anchor. And you can change the size relative to the size of the parent. So we want it to be on top. And we want it to go maybe to half of the screen. So we have uh, like four different uh, or three situations. So we type in dot five, and now it splits our screen perfectly uh, in two. Okay, um, let's create another one. Just copy this one. Let's call it uh, control. I'm never really sure. Is control written with one L or two Ls? One. Okay, perfect. Everything right. <laughs> Let's uh, give it a new look, maybe some uh, pink. Uh, we want to have it down here. So our bottom anchor is there. Our top anchor is at 0.5. And horizontally, we don't want to fill it anymore. So we also go to anchors. Uh, we want the right one to move over here. So the right anchor goes to dot 0.5. And we're going to do the same again. And we're going to call this one presets. And we're going to have the right anchor at z oops, at one and the left anchor at dot five. And we're going to have a yellow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this works really nice. Let's have a look. So, maybe let's begin with the preview. So, we uh, enter our preview. And now we're starting to use widgets. Finally, fuck yeah. <laughs> Uh, we go into our palette, and uh, we're going to look for UI, basic widgets, and we want uh, two different types of uh, what we can see. So we want to see our output. So let's grab, if we roll down, we should have somewhere and uh, OP viewer. So let's drop in our OP viewer. There's a weird tint to itself. Hmm. And uh, again, we're going to, to our layout page first. And we're setting both to uh, anchor. So we want it in horizontal mode to fill the right side of our interface. So we say left anchor dot five, and in vertical we want it to fill. So it's here, but it's not doing anything by now. And we also want to have maybe a, a label to see what's going on. So now we can just go into our label and activate the display. And it's here, <laughs> which is uh, not what we wanted. Uh, we don't want to have it called viewer, but we want actually want to have it called output. So we can just change the, the widget label right in output. So now you see here is our output. And we want it to be in the center. Oh, no, it's the top. Yeah, OK. And we want in vertical mode, 
we want it to have a fixed height. So maybe something like, uh, I don't know, 20. And we want to fill it and set it to one. Okay, and now they're left and right. She's uh, taking a lot of space up just to say that this is our output. So we can now go to our children tab. And here we say top to bottom, which takes all the children which are inside of the widgets and orders them from top to bottom. So now if we see we have a really nice output and here something will be displayed. So how do we uh, get our output to be displayed? We go to the OP Viewer that, uh, tab. And maybe let's split left right again. Close this one. So we go up to my VJ interface. And we see we have our out one here. So we can uh, just put in here a uh, parent my VJ, not CJ, VJ. And we want to have the operator out one. And we have to set this one to an expression. So now if something would happen in here. Yes. Yes, is a widget. No, this one actually is a widget. It is uh, here, located in the basic widgets. So, why is nothing... Ah! Okay. Ah, okay. Really? So, when I, when I go into feedback... Hmm? Okay, really weird. But it's working now. So if we view our interface, we now see this is our output. <sighs> Are we cool? I think I can do it. Uh, I will do the whole OP view again, basically, because uh, we could just copy this one, but we will do it again. Repetition is the mother of learning. So let's do it again. We go into the palette, basic widgets, uh, and let's call this one output viewer. So we take our OP viewer in the palette under basic widgets and drop it in. Looks like this. We go to label and we give it a label. So we call this one selected comp. Well, we are not seeing anything here. So we enable the display flag for our label. And we see it's on the left side. So what we want to do is we want to change the mode for horizontal size and set it to fill. And say we want to fill 100%. So we set it to 1. And for the horizontal mode, uh, vertical mode, we don't want it to fill actually everything of it. So we go to a fixed height and give it maybe a height of uh, 20. And because it uh, looks shitty when it's so far on the left, we say the... Uh, the uh, horizontal align to uh, center. 
and to um, don't have it like 50-50, we change the alignment for the children to top to bottom. So now that the labor comp and the actual viewer are transported to yeah another thing. So, and because we want to have it now on the left side of our preview, we set the horizontal mode again to anchor. And now we use the right anchor and set it to half of our parent uh, UI element. So we set it to 0.5. And for the height, we want to fill it. So now if we go up one level, our interface should look like this. So we have our currently selected comp and we have what we are outputting. And because we need a way to, to find out what we currently actually have selected, we're going to do this later. <laughs> uh, so let's go. Uh, any questions about this one? Uh, because we have like now a lot of different components like the switch, the effect, the uh, generators, and uh, we want to edit them without uh, just having the the uh, output. No, it's not a grid, but uh, we will now create a, a selection bar for different styles of. Uh, where we can select a comp and the currently selected component will be displayed in our selected comp window. Hmm? Okay, so let's go to controls. Um, let's go inside. And now it's going to get funky. Uh, because at first we want to find out how many tags we have used and what tags. And for this, and we're going to use it more than once, we're going to use the uh, OP find that. So it's uh, under that. And it is here. And with the OP find that, you can really kind of easily analyze your, uh, yeah, your operators. So we want to analyze our engine and find out uh, what is inside. Yeah, what is inside. So uh, we type in into the component we are looking at and all the children of the component. Uh, we're looking at, oops parent, my VJ, and uh, we're looking inside of our engine. So hit enter, error, and now we already see, okay, we have, uh, we have edge, we have the out one, we have the RAM noise switch feedback noise sphere. And we don't want to actually look at our out one because we don't care about this one. It's not a base comp. We didn't create it with custom parameters. 
So we're going to filters. And for the type, we just type in base comp. And this is the reason I think someone asked why we put the switch also in a base comp. So we can uh, really easily filter it out. Type in base comp. Yes. Yes. The text? Text, yeah, 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 exactly. That's why it's going to come in handy. <laughs> But uh, it, it, using the text, uh, we are now finding our text. And uh, so what do we want to have as output? As we are just looking for text, we don't need the name. We don't need the type. We just need the text. So yeah, so now we have our text which is nice, but um, maybe we will also want to, don't need like three times generator and two times of X, and even if it gets more, uh, we don't need it. So let's do some that magic. Let's first use a select, and use by select the rows, select the index, and set it to one so we get rid of our tags uh, headline. Yes. Sorry. Oops. Ah. Uh. Yeah, you have to enable the uh, expression mode. So if you click on components and then, ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you put in an expression here, which is uh, my VJ, and then we are looking for the engine. You have to manually uh, set it to expression mode so you can find it. Uh, you could, but uh, yeah, global shortcuts, a different story. You can, uh, it, because we are creating a component, we can easily export and use in other projects with uh, other components together, um, it could give a conflict. Because, yeah, you have the, the engine, and then you have maybe another component where there's also an engine inside. So this way, using the parent uh, shortcut, we are always inside of our world of my VJ engine, and everything outside is uh, none of our business makes it all a little bit easier. So, and uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to use the, I think it was the sort, sort that. And the sort that has a unique output. And we say, single row, and now we just have our three uh, tags. Hi, Corey. <laughs> so, for example, if we uh, go inside of, so you don't have to follow this one, I just want to show you what's going on. Uh, if you go inside of our engine, uh, we create a new base. You will see it gets created. And when we add a tag, something like uh, pointless, we now have automatically our pointless uh, tag in our UI. So uh, you don't have to touch the UI in the AMP because you just add your comps 
and just import them maybe as external and they will just come in from alone. So let's delete this one and the pointless tag is gone. And now we're going to convert all of this to a text. And let's put in a null and let's call this one tags. And because this, for my taste, are uh, already way too many operators, we're just uh, going to select them, collapse them, and call this one the tag finder. So, yes. Uh, you have to go to columns on the OP find and you can just remove the tags. Yes, I, I think we already did like with the uh, switch we put inside of the edge. No, no, yeah, go into the edge. Ah, okay, no, you didn't do it. So I, I just put in uh, a switch and uh, fed in like the, the input also. So this way now when you Ah, not, not a switch, sorry, a cross. It's a cross. Now, for the feedback, I just uh, use the uh, the fader. Yes. Uh, it's not the best way, performance-wise, to do it this way, because it will not stop cooking. But this is something for another time. We, we maybe can have a look, but... I think this would go too far. But I think we are good in time, so maybe we can even go to some tips and tricks. More of organizing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no, this is this is definitely a good idea to put it outside, but for simplicity, uh, no, I was just like, have we have some. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically, basically, yes. 
But um, yeah, it is anyway a good idea to try to centralize stuff. So this is with the properties, for example. Uh, you can, for example, have like a bank maybe of, of four or five uh, LFOs. And then you just create a property LFO for, for all of them. And then you can, for example, just change uh, the property to one of the five LFOs you have in your bank, for example. Yeah, with a button and a script. Yeah, we will come to, to button. Yeah, you can uh, have actually execute uh, code from widgets. So you don't need to create any uh, that or just there. Uh, is everyone ready with this one? I would like to continue. Is it okay if I continue? Or, uh, yeah. Okay, so now back to UI business. Um, we can now use uh, folder tabs in our basic widgets, which is here. So drop it in. And there we go to, to menu. So I was wondering, Ivan, about this uh, menu option table. Could I could I uh, drop in, maybe? Ah, because it's not really doing anything. Uh, oops. Oh, yeah, include row, column. Ah, yeah, column one labels. So it's a. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Nice. Okay. Maybe this was a. Okay, <laughs> cause I want it my way. Okay, so let's ignore this one because it's not working as intended. So for menu names, we can just type in stuff like uh, FX, generator, and now we have a nice selection. And uh, we can use an expression again. And we're calling it by op text dot text. And of course, we have to enable our expression mode again. And now we have FX generator control. Pretty nice. Just thinking, I think maybe we can even skip this one. Yeah, okay, we don't need the uh, convert here. We can uh, remove it. Just have a table, which will come in handy because we need it. So, let's see. Okay. Oh, I'm getting, could eat something. Um. Hmm? Yeah, but I think uh, thirteen thirty is the official lunch time. So, okay. But uh, I think we can finish at least the basis. Um, so now we have a nice menu to control what a uh, category of uh, component we want to control. So let's call this one a uh, category. So, but now we need um, something to hold our different categories. Um, and for this, we can use a replicator. Who used the replicator before? One, two, three. It's really nice. I think it's good that uh, we're going over all this. Uh, with a replicator, you can uh, copy a component many times. And you can use a table, which we have here, um, to 
um, have a template of how often you want to replicate on uh, another component. So let's uh, create a new container. And let's call this one category master. And let's create our replicator, which is uh, here. It's a component. And I have uh, C, there's an error, or at least a warning, which is, uh, of course, because we are missing two important things. We are missing our uh, template that, and we are missing our master operator, which should be replicated. So we want to have uh, a category for selectable category for every tag we have. So we just use the tags and drop it into our template that table. And we're going to use the category master. And we're going to drop it into our master operator. And then we can use a layout origin to move it where it's visible. And you see it's called item one item two, but we actually have three, uh, three tags. And this is because we don't want to uh, ignore the first row we actually have here. So let's disable this one. And we have uh, item zero, item one, item two. Perfect. The problem now is all of our items in our category master are going to be displayed. So they are filling up the space we have. So if we take a look at our UI, oh, it's here, and uh, nothing's really happening because they are not visible in this way. So we don't want them to display. So we go into a panel of our category master. So every edit now we are doing, we have to do to our category master first, and then we have to replicate them. And we're disabling display. And we're going to uh, recreate all of our operators. And now they also will not be displayed and not take any part in our UI business for now. And uh, we want to have a way of, of uh, telling our item uh, what tag it belongs to. And to make it really easy, we're just going to to create a category master. I'll maybe call this one zero for simplicity. And we're going to say customize component. I want to create a string. And we call this one tag. And what we can now do is we can uh, write a new expression. And we can just ask for operator tag. And we want to have uh, the row of the index we're looking at. So that uh, item 0 is looking at fx, item 1 is looking at generator, and item 2 is looking at control. So we're looking for op tags. Uh, we can use these hard brackets. Uh, we can use a uh, row index and a column index. And uh, the row index is just my own index. And there's this really nice function of uh, digits you can call on an operator to uh, get the index in the name. So this one returns, uh, if you ask for item 0.digits, you will get a 0, and so on. So we type in me.digits for the row and the column 0. And of course, we want to have an expression. So now you see we're, because it's category, category master 0, we're looking for fx. And if we recreate our operators here and have a look at the tag, it's, this one is referencing fx generator and control. OK, so I think this is a good point.
to go for lunch. 